Hey guys, Mr. Weber again. Um, depending on the order you watch this video, this may not be again, this may be the first time that you've seen me. But in any case, I'm gonna be going over on this uh, monitor that you cannot see. I have the exam going up. I'm just gonna go over um, the 40 questions that I have uh, from, from this test bank. Um, and then uh, I'll, I'll be pulling out some words uh, that you guys are gonna wanna know, right? And, and uh, I guess, uh, Kind of elaborating on things. So, uh, just starting off here, uh, you know, incentives. It's the first thing we talked about in this class, right? Incentives matter, right? And you can think, I mean, who do incentives matter for? They matter for you. They matter for me. They matter for everybody, right? Um, in, in economics, we assume one of the assumptions we have to make is that everyone's rational, and that means that everyone is reacting to the incentives that uh, that are being offered, right? And that that you know, depending on what the incentives are, you know, if we change the incentives, that's going to change your choice. That you make right and we know that economics you know simply put is the study of choices so you know incentives matter then for everyone right for everyone so um you know again you know everyone is rational what what does it mean when we assume what does it mean when we assume that right i kind of just explained that right we, we assume that everyone's rational meaning that everyone reacts to incentives yeah Okay, um, and then uh, you know what? What are we looking at in economics? We already talked about that as well already. Okay, and then uh, you're going to want to know this idea of marginal cost or marginalism, right? Marginalism, where it's the it's the looking at okay, if we are going to do this, uh, you know, if we go up to doing this one more time, you know, what's my marginal cost? What's my marginal benefit? All right, so marginal cost versus marginal benefit okay and I think this is gonna always say ah oh, no there we go I just misspelled something marginalism sure alrighty more on marginalism ooh opportunity cost there is no such thing there is no such thing as a free lunch so hard I, every time I have to spell it out um, but this is the idea of opportunity cost, right? There's no such thing as a free lunch. Uh, opportunity cost, right? Whenever you make a decision, you guys have a spending assignment that's based on this. Uh, do this Friday, right? Where you're going to look at all your spending and you're going to tell me about the opportunity cost, right? Man, I spent $40, Mr. Weaver. I could have put that $40 to, towards buying a video game, right? I mean, I, I think I used that in the, uh, in the example as well. So maybe I should get my mind off that. Anyways. And, and by the way, right? There's no such thing as a free lunch. That implies that everything guys everything's gonna have an opportunity cost right nothing you do will be free and everything that you do even if you get free tickets to go to a concert well shoot that's another shift you could have picked up at work right everything has a cost everything does okay let's see here let's get scarcity right so for scarcity what what is this so we have our, our resources limited or unlimited well, you guys should all know that resources are limited. And that's competing against what? Well, what what of our what are, what about our desires? Well, desires there's at least more of them than there are resources, right? And that's a problem, right? That means we have to figure out how are we going to get these limited these limited resources to all these people that want all these different things, right? We're starting to talk about this now as we talk about relative scarcity. Right, where we looked at rocks and yachts. Everyone in the world could have a rock if they wanted to. Yeah. Could everyone in the world have, you know, fifty rocks? I don't know. Right? How many how many rocks can we get up to before at some point they become, you know, relatively more scarce? Uh, but as far as yachts are concerned, not everybody in the world could have a yacht, right? So we have a problem, right? If everyone in the world wants a yacht, then how do we distribute it, right? Well, you know, if we if we increase the price, then some people aren't gonna want the yacht for that price, right? Or can't afford it at that price. All right. Anyways, without going on a uh, rabbit trail there, let's go ahead and continue on. Ooh, here we go. The law, the laws, the law of demand. Let's start here. The law of demand, right? This states that as prices, as price, let's say this, as price increases, quantity demanded, what happens, right? If something goes up in price, well, think, well, shoot, if something goes up in price, I don't want it as much, right? So yeah, quantity demanded decreases, okay? Um, and as price 
decreases quantity demanded. What's gonna happen? Well, shoot, if you can see that as price you know increases, it decreases. Well, then as price goes down, well, shoot, if something's on sale, I want to buy more. So we want to buy more when the prices are lower, right? And this makes sense, right? That's, that's you know again, uh, economics is the study of common sense. Okay, let's talk about the law of supply. I just realized I a word here. The law of supply. What does that state? Well, as price increases, if I could spell, what happens to quantity supplied? If you're selling something, do you want to supply more or less when the price is high? Think about your labor, right? If your boss, you know, is paying you hundred dollars, do you want to work more or less? Well, shoot, if I was getting paid hundred dollars an hour, I'd want to work more, right? So my quantity supplied increases, and as price decreases, if your boss says, "Hey, I can only pay you five dollars an hour." Uh, what's going to happen to your willingness to work? Well, you aren't going to want to work as much. So quantity, whoopsies, decreases. Okay. You'll notice here, folks, I want you to see something. Uh, price and quantity follow each other when it's the law of supply, when it's the law of demand. Look up here. They go opposite. Okay. They go opposite one another. Okay. This is in what we call an inverse relationship or a negative relationship. This is a positive relationship. Okay, so then when we show like a, a supply and demand graph, I don't know of the best way to, let's do this, supply and demand uh, graph, I guess. Let's see if I can find an image. Here we go. Oh, this, this image is perfect, guys. This image is perfect. Let's copy image. Look at that. Bring this way down though. We don't need it that big. Okay. So what is this graph showing? Well, on the supply curve, this is showing at every single price. These are all the quantities that people want, right? And we can see that when the price is low, the the the, the quantity supplied is low, and when the price is high, the quantity supplied is high. Hey, that matches up with what our law of supply said. Yeah. Okay. So this is our supply curve. It shows at all the different prices, all the different uh, amounts that people can sell, and we have our demand curve at all these different prices, right? At all these different prices, uh, we can see all the amounts that people want to buy, right? When the price is high. Yeah, we can see the quantity's low. Yeah, we can we can see that there. And as the price gets uh, lower, wee price gets low. Hey, people want to buy more. Pretty cool. Okay, so let's go on. Let's keep on chugging. Ooh, this point in the middle. What's that called? You remember? Say it to yourself before I type it out. E equilibrium. Okay, equilibrium is the price you'll notice here at this price. Hey, look, the quantity supplied and the quantity demanded. Those are equal, right? So the equilibrium. This is the price at which quantity demanded and quantity supplied are equal, right? Uh, the, the This quantity on the supply curve and this quantity on the demand curve, they're the same at this price, okay? So this is what we call the market price. This is where they tend to get down to. If the price is too high, people will, um, people will you know, drop the price so people buy more. Uh, if the price is too low, the, the suppliers will increase the price. Uh, that way they can afford to supply more for folks. Um, we always try to push towards this equilibrium price, okay? Okay, so let's start looking at disequilibrium then, okay? There's two types of disequilibrium. We have a shortage, that's the first one, okay? A shortage, if we look here, folks, a shortage um, on this graph, which, which one is the shortage, when the price is too high or when the price is too low? Well, it's gonna be when the price is too low because if, if we have a price down here where I'm moving my cursor, Look where it intersects the supply curve. The quantity's low. Look at where it intersects the demand curve. Whoa, all the way over here. That's a pretty high demand, okay? So there's more people wanting something or there, there's more of a good being wanted than there is being supplied. We have a shortage. So typically what happens is, again, like I said, they'll, the suppliers, they'll increase the price so they can afford to supply more, right? Uh, when it intersects, you know, when at the price, we only have this small amount being supplied, but when they increase the price, hey, look, they can supply a higher quantity, okay? So this is where, a price at which I'm going to say QD quantity demanded. I'm going to go ahead and put that up here. Uh, put these in quotations. That way I don't be too silly here. Okay. Uh, QD is quantity demanded, and QS is quantity supplied. Okay. A price at which QD and QS at which QD is greater than QS. Okay, and then we have a surplus. This is the opposite, and as you might imagine, this is a price, if it's the opposite, it is a price at which the quantity supplied is greater than the quantity demanded, and that would be a price up here, right? So at this price, 
look here. It intersects the demand curve right here, okay, a low quantity. And then if we follow this along to the supply curve, whoa, it's a huge quantity up here, right? So there's a whole lot being supplied of this good, but not a lot being demanded by individuals. So you can imagine if your store uh, or think, hey, you know, we're getting towards the end of summer here. Uh, as, as we get towards the end of summer, what's going to happen to all the swimsuits, all of the uh, all of the, the clothes to wear in the warm weather? Well, they're going to put it on the clearance rack, right? What does that mean? Well, it means that you know they're going to stop buying it. They're not supplying as much, and they actually drop the price, right? When they put it on the clearance rack. So, matter of fact, when we have a surplus, that's what firms will tend to do. They they will sell things on the cheap, right? That that is a surplus, right? When there's more the quantity supplied, it's greater than the quantity demanded. This will push prices down. I guess I should uh, pushes the price down. And then a shortage then would push the price up. Yeah. Okay, let's keep chugging along. Oh, trade. Why is trade so why is trade so beautiful, guys? Well, in a free market system, uh, the only people that you trade with are people that you voluntarily trade with. So we call this voluntary trade. Okay. So you got to think, if, if we're trading voluntarily, that means that both of us could back out if we wanted to, which then means that the only reason that we're trading is if you think what you're getting is better than what you're giving up. And the only reason I'm trading is because what I think I'm getting is better than what I'm giving up, right? So voluntary trade means that when people are trading, they're both increasing their wealth, right? So uh, we stand to benefit from trade because both people end up better off, right? No matter what the case is, right? It, it doesn't matter, you know, you, you you know, do, do you end up better off if you trade two of one something or someone else's one thing? Well, no, right? I mean, if I trade, you know, $5 to get, you know, one, I don't know, big bag of candy, does that make me, you know, less off because, I, you know, I spent five of something to get one thing? Well, no, right? It's, you know, people end up better off when things are, uh, when, when they trade, right? We know this because if, if they if they did not end, better, end up better off, they wouldn't have traded, right? So voluntary trade always leads to wealth creation, okay? Let's keep on chugging along. Okay, we talked about that. Ooh, so if trading creates wealth, then what if, what if we have these guys, transaction costs. Transaction is another way of saying trade. So if it costs you to trade, what happens to wealth, right? It decreases. The more it costs us to trade, the less we're able to generate wealth, right? Because if trade generates wealth, we can't do it as much because it costs. Well, we can see how that leads to a decrease in wealth accumulation, right? So it reduces how much we can trade and reduce, um, you, know, you know, maybe I would like to trade with you but because of the, the, the cost to trade with you be too high, well, that's just, you know, one more mutually beneficial agreement that we can't get to, right? So uh, we have seen over the, over the course of history, transaction costs decrease, right? We've seen that we've developed ways of traveling, right? We, we were like, hey, there's that four-legged horse thing. I'm going to go ride that so I can get to further places. And then we learned about, you know, tying some wagons to it when we had that whole wheel thing. I don't know. I'm assuming we had the wheel invented before we uh, domesticated horses. Anywho, we also invented, you know, ships to sail and then we got to steamships and railroads and then cars and then we're like, yeah, let's just fly in the air. That sounds right. <sighs> Crazy, right? We do all sorts of things to reduce transaction costs. And there's also firms are, you know, they reduce transaction costs, right? I have no clue who the world I can buy, um, you know, some plumber's tape from, right? I don't know who, who makes that, but you see, do it best. They do, right? So do it best. They reduce transaction costs because there's, you know, information transaction costs that they help me. Um, you know, reduce, right? And that's why they're valuable, yeah? So let's go ahead and keep on going. Uh, we've already talked about that. We've already talked, ooh, so when it comes to trading, what should you produce? There's this idea of absolute advantage. Absolute advantage is where you are, um, this belongs to the person slash Let's say party. That way I don't have to type all that out. This belongs to the party who can make the item most, uh, make the item, we'll say the best, okay? So in the case of, I, I use the example in class, the lawyer and the receptionist. You know, let's say the lawyer has been like a speed typist fiend. They're always playing those flash games on the internet and they have really good fast typing skills and they're really good at all the secretarial work. Now, this lawyer, she's also a lawyer, right? So does that necessarily mean if she has the absolute advantage in being a lawyer that, you know, sorry, in, in being, you know, doing all the secretarial work that she should do the secretarial work? Well, no, because you see, she does not have what we call the 
Ooh, I'm on a second page now. I'm going to keep these two together because they're similar to one another. Or they, they not similar, they go together. Comparative advantage. This belongs to the party who can make the item at the lowest. Here it comes. Opportunity cost. Let's go ahead and move this guy down. Hoop. Party. Man, spelling's hard. Okay. So instead, um, you know, while the secretary may not have the absolute advantage, they may not be the best secretary, right? The lawyer may be a better secretary than them. But that doesn't mean the lawyer should be a secretary. No, the lawyer should go off and do the, 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 the lawyery things. That's a word. And the secretary should do the secretarial things because the secretary has a comparative advantage, right? The, the, the secretary gives up less. They have a lower opportunity cost when they're doing secretary things. And, you know, if, if the lawyer were to do the secretary things, they would have an extremely high opportunity cost, right? They could be, you know, getting ready for a case. They, they could be meeting with clients, but instead here they are typing on a computer, getting things, you know, ready, right? So uh, we should produce according to our comparative advantage, right? The lawyer should be doing the lawyery things and the secretary should be doing the secretarial things. Okay, let's go ahead and keep on rolling. And this is true, not just for individuals, right? It's true for, for companies. It's true for countries, right? It's true for everyone at every single level. Okay, and uh, this then tells us that we should what? Well, we should specialize, right? Um, specialization leads us to create a lot more because we can trade for what we don't have, right? Uh, me, guys, think about me. Uh, think about you and your job, right? If, if you want to get pants, you don't go out and make blue jeans, right? You don't sit at home, right? I, I could sit at home for a whole week and I don't even think I get a pair of Daisy Dukes done, right? No one wants to see me in those, right? But if instead I go to work for a week, I can then spend some of my money and I can buy a pair of jeans and have a whole bunch of money left over to buy all the other things I need as well, right? We are wealthier when we specialize in doing one thing and then trade for what we need, right? And it's true for me. It's true for a company. It's true for a country. Guys, it's true at every level, okay? that's uh, Specialization is important because it allows us to then benefit from comparative advantage. It allows us to benefit from trade and so on, okay? So we talked about this here um what is I'll, I'll write this here what is needed this isn't a question in the i mean it's related that's why i'm going over it but what is needed for economic growth okay well we need um you know we talked already about uh you know grow uh we, we need uh investments not investments um, we need more education. <laughs> I spell education incorrectly. That's so ironic. Uh, we need more technological developments. We need, and of course, th these two things don't matter, right? Well, okay, we also need trade. We need, yeah, we need trade. Uh, but guys, these three things, they aren't going to occur. We're not going to have, uh, you know, more education. We're not going to have better technology become, you know, getting creative. We're not going to have people trading if they do not have their property rights being protected okay and furthermore when when property uh rights are finally being protected then it's important that firms are able to compete that uh the government you know firms aren't being given an unfair advantage um because you know if that's the case then people aren't able to compete against them and we know that the only reason that mcdonald's you know uh, cares about offering us a good product at a low price is because if they don't offer us a good product at a low price where am i going wendy's right or you know if i'm not you know, if 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 we don't have competition, there's you know no reason for a firm to care about making better products. There's no reason for a firm to care about investing in education, investing in technology, right? Um, there, there's no reason for them to care about what we want if there's not competition, right? So it's important for competition to exist. So, um, and of course, we can get into that later. Okay, not, uh, let's see. The shifters of the supply and demand. I'm going to go ahead and add that up here. I'm going to add it right under this guy. The shifters of demand. I recommend going back and looking at those slides um, because honestly, this this video would get pretty long if I went over every single one of those again. But essentially, know that for demand, right? If there's more people wanting a good or you know, if consumers have a, have a reason for wanting more of a good, that's going to increase demand. And we know that when we increase demand, we shift the curve to the right 
and that will increase price. And if for whatever reason, consumers are wanting less of a good, it could be because there's less consumers, it could be because the consumers just don't care about it as much anymore, we'll, we'll decrease demand. That will shift demand to the left, decreasing price, okay? And then you also probably wanna go and review, I'll once again keep this together, the shifters of supply, right? Now for the shifters of supply, this essentially all boils down to, okay, um, how many suppliers are there and does it cost more to supply, okay, or less, okay? So how many are there and how much does it cost? If it costs more and the, or maybe there's less suppliers, you're going to see a decrease in supply and that will shift the supply curve to the left, okay? And that will, that will uh, increase the price. A decrease in supply leads to an increase in price. And if we increase supply because maybe there's more suppliers, maybe uh, it, it's cheaper to produce it, we can see then that that's going to lead to an increase in supply or a lower price, okay? Pretty cool. Pretty cool. Yeah, as far as specifics about these things go, if you want to look at those, yeah, you can go ahead and go back to the slides and check them out. Um, let's go ahead and continue on though. So, let's see. Ah, this beautiful word right here, profit, okay, profit. Um, profit, what is that? Well, that's just when, if uh, I'm gonna use a colon here to not make things confusing. Um, revenue, right, that's how much money your business earns. If you subtract your costs, how much it costs to produce that revenue, um, whatever's left over equals your profit. If it's positive, I'll put a little Uh, hyphen here or slash I guess or that'll be your loss if it's negative okay um, so of course we want um, we want entrepreneurs right people that combine resources do we want them to combine them in a way that makes them more valuable or less valuable right because this represents the resources that they use their cost right the revenue represents what they're turning it into right how much they're selling it for so if they're taking something, taking resources, and they're turning it into something that we value more, dude, that's great, right? They're doing a service to us, right? So we want them to be making profit. However, do we want them to be making losses? Do we want them to be taking resources that we value and turning them into something we value less? Ugh. No, right? Because that, that's going to make us less wealthy. That's taking resources and, and putting them in things that aren't uh, valuable, right? So we want people to be making profits. We want entrepreneurs to be taking them and turning them into things that are valued more. Um... You know, so that, that then tells you then, uh, you know, I'll put a little uh, question here. How do you know what you should produce? Well, that, that tells you, look at above, right? If, if I said that we want profits, how do you know what you should produce? Whatever's profitable. Okay. Um, and then look at it personally, right? Looking at this personally, um, you know, what, why should you uh, worry about you know what others produce or sorry what others value right uh, why why should you worry about doing what others value right why well, how come I you know have not made the decision to to live my life as a, with under the career as an underwater basket weaver right would my life be as good right um, so so how how you know how have I come to my conclusion as far as what I'm producing right education and. Uh, how could could you come to the conclusion in your life is about what you should produce, okay? Okay, and then we have this uh, broken window fallacy. And this is uh, just the idea that uh, uh, you have the boy, he throws the window uh, through the, through the he throws the window, I say that every time, he throws the ball through the glass window, breaks the window, and the crowd on looks on him and says, oh yes, good job, boy, oh, you just helped solve, you know, you helped uh, boost the economy because now we're gonna have to have a higher, higher glazier to come in and fix that window. And of course, Bastiat, the Frenchman from the 1800s that, uh, you know, created this story, or at least he was retelling the story uh, he's, you know, we, we call this the broken window fallacy. He says, no, come on, guys. Uh, this baker, you know, if that window was not broken, that baker would have maybe bought a new oven, hired somebody, you know, maybe went home and bought shoes for his kid. Uh, this is a fallacy. It's an incorrect way of thinking, right? So destruction does not, big letters here, does not 
uh, promote growth, okay? And in the same way, um, you know, we look at uh, in, in the uh, realm of government spending, right? When money goes to the government, via taxes, it is taken away from individuals, individuals who would have spent it elsewhere, right? So when I pay money to the government, sure, you know, it may be creating road, uh, jobs, right? If it goes to make a road, yeah, we're gonna have to pay somebody to, to you know, build that road and that will be a job created. But, you know, people also would have spent that at the, you know, local diner to go see a movie, maybe not right now, but they, they would have spent that money elsewhere, right? So to say that that money's, you know, helping the government uh, because it's going to the government, it's helping the economy. Well, no, it would have helped the economy just in a different way, right? So the broken window uh, fallacy also applies there, right? We're just, you know, really uh, people, it's not just that, right? But not only is, is uh, it's resources that we're devoting, right? Those dollars represent resources. So it's people that would be producing things in the private economy uh, and the private sector are now producing things for the public sector, right? So we're not really gaining jobs, really just kind of moving them around. And uh, there's a cost to doing that, right? Uh, you just remember, right? There's no such thing as a free lunch. No such thing as a free lunch. Okay. Um, leave you with this question here. Do jobs matter? Okay. Um, and I'm going to say no. Why is it? Well, yeah, I like having a job. Well, no, it's, it's right. I could, we could all have jobs, right? Uh, I, I could make it so, you know, on Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays, we're all digging holes. And then on Tuesdays and Thursdays, we're, we're filling them back up, right? Boom. Just like that, I solved our job problem. So it's not jobs, right? It's, it's producing things that matter. Those things are what increases our quality of living, yeah? Okay. Um, just because this is one of the questions that was missed on the quiz quite a bit, let's go back here to profits. What happens if a firm is making losses? What happens if a firm is making losses? What do they do, right? If I have a lemonade stand and I'm spending $5 every day to run my lemonade stand and only, it only earns me $3, am I gonna keep doing that? No, right, I'm, I'm gonna stop running my lemonade stand, so I'm gonna leave that, uh, that lemonade market, okay? And of course, you know, you don't want me doing that, right? Because I'm, I'm taking, you know, resources that people value higher and turning them into something they value lower, right? So people don't, you know, you don't want me running a, a lemonade stand at a loss. Okay. All right, we have this, this idea of the invisible hand. This is um, Adam Smith's. Uh, he, he referenced this. He said, uh, you know, people... They're all interested in self, right? They're all self-interested individuals. However, that's not a bad thing because, you know, for some reason, people, you know, because uh, they only trade to mutually benefit, mutually benefit from trades, um, these these individuals that are only interested, self-interested, right? Not necessarily, you know, selfish, right? Uh, even the, the saints among us have been uh, self-interested individuals. It's just they're, they're things that they were, you know, interested in for themselves were also, you know, helping others, okay? These self-interested individuals they still end up promoting an end uh, which they do not know of, right? Think about the iPencil video we watched where there was the lumberjack that was cutting down wood and that wood went to a factory and that, that at that factory it was refined and then that refined wood went to a pencil factory and it was turned into pencils. Dude, that lumberjack had no clue that he was helping, you know, some girl learn how to learn how to write. He just, dude, I'm gonna turn on my chainsaw, I'm gonna cut down this tree and I'm gonna make some money, right? He, Self-interested, yet he's promoting an end of which he did not know, right? That's the idea of the invisible hand, right? Self promoted individuals um, let's say sometimes without knowing because right, some people do try to you know promote an end which they do care about right people that uh, are being altruistic uh, sometimes without knowing promote and uh, what, what, what's a uh, um, Let's say greater beneficial
for all of the, let's say for all of society. How about that? Okay. Uh, you guys may also know this is, uh, you know, the butterfly effect. We talked about that a little bit in class, uh, as well as on the on the uh, slide with Henry Hazlitt's quote. You know, I had a picture of the butterfly up there, right? But uh, just the idea that, you know, small, these small interactions all across the economy, you know, they, they, they actually end up having way, way larger outcomes than we can um, observe. Okay. And this then this gives us the idea then that you know it's not a you know a government central planner telling us all what to do. Uh, instead, it's people making their own decisions, right? It, it's not organization from the top down that is the most effective. That's not what Adam Smith is saying here. He's saying it's people doing their own things, organizing themselves from the bottom up. That's what's going to promote the most um, beneficial ends for society. Let's see here. Going back up to, looks like I've lost, uh, there it is, absolute comparative advantage, okay? Um, you know, how? let's ask this question again. How do you know what you should produce? So or let's say, what should we produce? What should we trade for? Well, think about the the receptionist and the secretary. Well, what, what should the secretary produce? The secretary should produce secretarial labor, okay? And then they'll trade for literally everything else that they want to buy in order to help themselves, right? You, you can't eat secretarial labor, so what do they do? They go and produce secretarial labor, and then they take that money and they go and buy things that uh, they need to sustain life. Same thing for the lawyer, right? The lawyer will do lawyering, and then, again, making up words, We'll do some lawyering, uh, and then lawyering doesn't feed you. It doesn't. Uh, it's, it's, it's not a good shelter, but it gives you money, which you can then go buy uh, the things that you need. Okay. Uh, think about me. What do I produce? I produce what I have a comparative advantage in, just like the lawyer, just like the secretary. I I I produce education. That's what I have a comparative advantage in, and then I go and trade for other things, right? Because again, if I tried to make jeans, it'd be so expensive, right? So instead, I I specialize in doing one thing, and then I trade for whatever else, right? If it's cheaper to, you know, for me to produce it, then I'll produce it. But most of the time, the things are gonna be more expensive. So it's cheaper for me to do one thing, get the money and then buy it, right? Let's continue on. Ooh, here it is. Secondary effects. Okay, I'm actually not gonna put a hyphen out this and define this, okay? But secondary effects, right? Um, this again goes with Bastiat, right? We, we you know, we, 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 the scene and the unseen, we see the little boy breaking the window and it getting repaired. We do not see that, you know, the baker would have then been able to use all that money to reinvest in other areas, okay? In the same way, uh, secondary effects can often be ignored, right? Uh, we, we talked about in class with the steel tariffs, right? Okay, so we put a steel tariff. Okay, now foreign steel is more expensive. People start buying the U.S. steel instead. Hey, we just created jobs in the U.S. steel market because we're buying more U.S. steel. Yay! Oh, no! All steel is more expensive. Now everything that makes products with steel in the U.S., they end up losing jobs because it's more costly to make the items that they make, and if they're not making as many of them, then that means they cut back on the labor that they use to produce those things, right? So, you know, we lost automobile jobs, right? We had a bunch of different um, automobile plants here in the States closed down. One of them was in uh, Ohio, right? So there are these secondary effects that happen that we don't end up seeing, right? Uh, you know, or that we even focus on, right? People focus on, hey, yeah, we had we had steel jobs created because of this tariff. Woohoo, we did it. We didn't think about the secondary effects, right? Um, let's see here. Secondary effect. There, actually, I'm going to go ahead and save this now. Um, ah. Yeah, 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 okay, so one of the questions is about supply and demand and this thing called corn-based ethanol. Um, so this there was some legislation passed. The government said, hey, um, we're going to make it so that uh, more gasoline has to be made with gasoline or ethanol that was made with corn, right? So there has to be a certain uh, proportion of your gasoline that uh, is made with corn. So what do you think this would cause, right? If, if the government's saying, hey, you have to start making some of the gasoline with corn now, are there any secondary effects that you can think of, okay? Uh, that's the one question I'll give you a hint on just because you may not know what corn-based ethanol is. But 
um, if you know that uh, corn is now being required to be used in some of this gasoline, uh, what are some secondary effects that you can think of? Um, okay, we already talked about that. We already talked about that. And we already talked about... Ooh, let's go back up here to marginalism. When do you stop? When do you stop um, doing an activity? I'll go ahead and spell the rest. This can be producing, this can be consuming. When do you stop, right? You, you, you go to a buffet, when do you stop? Well, I, I stop, right? When I don't get any more enjoyment out of eating, right? How do I know when, when to stop hiring people, right? I could hire 100 people, why don't I? Well, you know, at some point, you know, we're gonna have too many cooks in the kitchen, right? I hire the fifth person and I'm able to make, you know, still make money off of them, but when I hire the sixth person, I'm paying them seven fifty an hour, but they don't earn me, you know, $7 an hour, right? So it's not worth it for me to hire them, yeah? So when the marginal benefit is exceeded by the marginal cost, that's when I stop, right? And in this case, you know, maybe instead of a buffet, right? I, <laughs> my cost for that the next bite is zero, right? Because I paid I, when I entered, right? So my, you know, every bite that I eat is zero, yeah? So at some point, taking another bite of food would have a negative benefit. I would feel horrible, more horrible because of taking that bite. Okay, guys, that's all we have. This document is going to be uploaded onto Canvas. Thank you so much uh, for watching. Uh, please use this uh, study guide to study. Uh, and uh, take care. Uh, if you have any questions before you take the test, please get into contact with me. Adios.